Okay, so after, I guess, about eight or nine years of marriage and everything, kids are here and they're, you know, growing and everything. And Joe and I decide that it's time for us to feed into each other because the kids are older now. I don't need a babysitter or anything. I have teenagers in the house. They can watch over Rachel, who was the last child that was born. So my husband was in the Navy reserves and each year he would go on active duty and would be gone at least about, it was supposed to be two weeks, but he had a top secret clearance. So he did a lot of uh, training in the military. So needless to say, they would keep him in Guam. They would keep this man like a month, almost two months over in Guam. And when he would come home, oh my God, the first thing the kids, they, they jump on him about their candy, their gifts, and their, all this old good stuff. But I'll tell you one funny thing was, Marguerite was maybe about 15 or 16 at the time, and he came home and he brought this girl a Gucci a Gucci bag and she's all excited over now he brought me my gifts also okay it was a beautiful bag and I'm sitting there and he looks at me and he said what is the problem I said Joseph I don't even have a Gucci I said I don't have a Gucci but you bought this girl a Gucci I said she's not gonna respect it and sure enough I'm gonna make a long story short she got mad at him one day and she was walking to the bus stop and I happened to look out and she took that bag and drug it on the ground from the house all the way to the bus stop. And I called her, come and look at your bag. Your what about $300 bag being drugged up to the bus stop. And he just looked at I said, I rest my case. He was so devastated, but I told him she doesn't realize the value of it. But any of who, Getting back to him being away and going away, I remember one year he was gone for about two months. And before he even left, they took him to California and he was out on this ship with um, regional growth and commerce. And all these guys are out there to look at this beautiful ship that they have. And Joe told me, the only time you call me out here is if it's an emergency. I told him, okay. So we had purchased a home at the uh, Lake of the Ozarks and I went down to check the house and someone had broken into the house, had thrown a boulder through our patio window and, and I needed to get in touch with him. I, for some reason, I could not remember our insurance company. If I could remember the insurance company, I never would have called him. So I made the phone call and I get all these click clicks. And finally, this guy answers, and I told him who I was and who I needed to speak to. It's not an emergency. I just need him to call me when he has a chance. The man tells me, hold on one moment, please. My husband said he was out on the top deck at the front of the ship, and they come and get him personally, bring him down, and it's me on the phone. I said, oh, baby, I told him it was an emergency, blah, 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 blah. I just need the insurance company. I told him what happened. And my husband started laughing. I said, what's so funny? He said, sugar, that was the admiral's secretary. I said, Joseph, I'm so sorry. He said, no, it's funny. He said, they're going to have a good laugh about this. He said, because this man took your call came and got me, and here I am on the phone with you. He said, oh, they're going to really rip me tonight. They're going to rip me. So, of course, the rip was, man, don't you ever do anything wrong because that woman is going to find you. She will find you. <laughs> but I thought it was unusual for them to even do something like that because normally they'll just give him the message and he calls when he's supposed to. But this particular time, he was gone for maybe about, a month and a half, and I decided that's it. I miss my husband. I got a hotel room, had it decked out for just me and him. I let him spend time with the kids when he got home, and I told him, I said, okay, 
this weekend, you belong to me. So I called and I made uh, reservations downtown. I told the young lady, I need a booth in a corner in the dark, in the back, so no one will bother us. We had dinner together and everything, and I took my husband to this hotel room, and he was, oh my God, what did you do? Of course, there were rose petals in the whole nine yards, and, and he was my boyfriend, my lover, my friend, and everything for that weekend. He belonged to me. But those were things that we did to each other. And another thing we used to do, it was news, in the newspaper, they used to have these little clips that said, love is. So we would cut those out and we would mail them. We wouldn't give them to each other. We would mail them to our jobs and send love notes to each other. And sometimes we would send uh, flowers and say, just because. So those were the little things that we did for each other. And I remember one time uh, he called me. Everybody on my job thought I had a lover, which I did. I did have a lover. This man called me, asked me what was I planning on doing this evening. I said, well, I was going home to my family. Asked me to change my plans and uh, how about if your lover picks you up? And I said, that would be fine. I said, so what time? And he tells me what time and everything. This man picks me up, has this beautiful picnic basket, and he knew exact. I love weeping willow trees. He found this weeping willow tree out at Forest Park. And we went up to Art Hill, sat there for a little while, and then we walked and found the weeping willow tree. Nobody could see us under this tree. We laid out our little picnic and we had our little snack together and just sat there and talked to each other and laughed and giggled. And of course, you know, a little smooching and everything. No one knew we were under there until we started laughing. And people were like, oh, looking around and looked down and saw us under there. <laughs> but those were little things that we used to do for each other. This man was a friend, a lover, confidant. Absolutely beautiful. When I wanted something, I would only ask him one time. One time. I would never revisit again. I would only ask him one time. And I did not realize that until my daughter, Marguerite, came to me one time. She must have been about 17 or 18. And she said to me, Mom, I noticed something about you. I said, what's that? She said, you only asked Daddy for something one time. And you never go back. Why? I said, because he didn't forget. I said, he didn't forget. He didn't say no, he wasn't going to do it or anything. He said, okay, I'll see about it. And sure enough, I would get it. Whatever I asked for, I would get that. And she said, why? And I told her, <laughs> I said, because I'm worth it. She said, you're worth it. I said, yes. I said, I'm worth it. We had our discussions. I didn't call them arguments because arguing, it took two people. And I was not a person that would argue. And I had told him that when we first got together, I do not argue, fuss, and fight. If we cannot talk, then it's a mute subject. And I just believed in not arguing and keeping up confusion and stuff like that. I know one time we did have a little discussion. It got overheated. And I grabbed my pillow and the cover, and I told him, you can just sleep by yourself tonight. And I marched on up to the family room and threw all my stuff on the couch and went to sleep. Woke up that morning, and I turned to put my feet on the floor. And when I turned to put my feet on the floor, my feet landed on top of my husband. And he looked up at me and I said, what are you doing? He said, baby, I told you we would never, ever sleep apart. Never. He said, now, yeah, I go on active duty. Yes, we're apart. He said, but when I'm home, no, never. So after that one incident, we never slept apart. Never. I don't care what was going on. 
If there was a heated argument, we would apologize to each other and move on with our life. So the arguing and stuff, it just keeps up uh, friction in the family. But that was something we would squelch real quickly because I didn't want my kids to grow up and thinking that marriage was always a conflict. There was always something going on, but we would always settle whatever it was. And it would be amicable and peaceful between us. We started vacationing down at the Lake of the Ozarks. And I mean, the kids grew up going down there. We would even stay down there for a whole summer, just fishing and swimming and going to the amusement parks and all those things. Joseph would get in the airplane and fly back home to check on the house, get the mail, and fly back down. We would sing, we would laugh, we would tell jokes going down to the lake. We even took some of their friends with us, and they would say our family was unusual, which was true. We were unusual. But I think the, as I got older in the marriage, I started noticing that my husband was truly a man of integrity and people would seek him out because he was a man of his word and he said the scripture that stuck with him it was better to 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 have a good name than all the riches so his name meant a lot one example was there was a hurricane katrina and the devastation down in uh, louisiana and i remember I knew it. People were knocking on my door. They were dropping off shoes, coats, clothing, food, water. I had to clear my family room because things were coming in so quickly. So finally he tells me, I'm like, Joe, people are dropping stuff off at the house. He says, oh, I forgot to tell you. I put out flyers about Hurricane Katrina <laughs> and that I'm gonna take stuff down to Louisiana. I told him, you can't get into Louisiana. They're not gonna let you. But needless to say, he pressed on. After he got all this stuff from our church members as well as from our neighbors, he realized the little trailer he had was not going to be big enough. He had a friend named Keith. Keith told him, Brother Joe, we need a truck. And he said, well, man, I don't know where we're going to get a truck from. He said, I'm going to find somebody that's going to give us a truck. So Keith gets in his car and he said he drove up and down West Florida and he happened to look over, saw this big 18 wheeler. Said he pulled over, got out, went in, told the man, sir, I need your truck. And said the man looked at him and laughed and said, you need my truck. He said, yeah told him what he needed it for, and he kept saying, me and my friend, me and my friend, my friend and I, we're, we're taking stuff down to people in Louisiana. And so the guy finally says to him, wait a minute, and you keep telling me about you. Now, who is your friend? He said, oh, his name is Joseph Robinson. So the guy stopped him and said, who? He said, Joseph Robinson, that's my friend. He said, is your friend an ex-policeman? He told him, yes. He said, the man pulled the keys out of his pocket, gave him the keys, reached in his other pocket, pulled out his wallet, gave him some cash. He said, now, you and Joe Robinson. He said, now, Joe Robinson, I know. He said, you all take those keys, put some gas in that truck, and deliver those goods to those people. Keith said he was so outdone he didn't know what to do. He left his truck there and drove the 18-wheeler to the church to pack up everything. And it filled, oh my God, it filled the 18-wheeler almost full with all the goods that they had. That young man told me, he said, I've heard people speak of having a good name and being a man of integrity. He said, but Joe Robinson, that name proved to be exactly what God said. It's better to have a good name than all the riches in the world. So I know my husband is a man, was a man of integrity, honorable. Oh, and the women loved him because he was such a gentleman. He was such a gentleman. An example is 
they were going to California and one young lady couldn't come until later that evening. She told me he was so concerned about her that he called her to find out about her flight when she was getting in and everything. And she said she burst into tears when she got off the airplane and Joe and two of his friends were there to greet her, take her luggage, put her in a car, drive her to her hotel room, made sure she was settled. She said she was so outdone and she was so flabbergasted. She said, but Carmelita, I cried. I cried. She said, oh my God, girl, you have a jewel. You have a jewel. And needless to say, I told her, yes, I know. And he's all mine. That's my jewel. But that's the type of person he was. He was more concerned about people being te taken care of, things being in place. He was a man of order. He did not like confusion. He did not like things being out of place. Even if we were going to a function, he wanted to be there to open the doors. And he wanted to be there to close the doors. But he was definitely a man of integrity. I know one time we, I asked him about McDonald restaurants. Could we get a McDonald restaurant? And he laughed at me and told me no. And I thought, wait a minute. You are telling me no, and you don't have any information to stand on to tell me no. Those restaurants cost millions of dollars. And I said, so, so, why can't we have this restaurant? He looked at me, he said, I don't understand you. I said, so Joseph, let's just venture out and find out about this restaurant. We did a flight that's called a poker run where you fly from one airport to another to pick up cards and all this other stuff, you know. So ahead of us was an airplane full of young black businessmen. Joseph's airplane was a little faster than theirs, so we finally caught up to them at one of the uh, airports ended up in the pilot's lounge and it's about four or five of them standing there. We go in, introduce ourselves and get to talking. And what do you do for a living? And, oh, one was some executive for famous bar and another one was with another kind all these, just all these beautiful positions. I happened to look over and this guy standing over in the corner. I walked over and I said, so what do you do? He said he owned a little restaurant. I said, what's the name of your little restaurant? Oh, you wouldn't be interested in it. And I stood there and he looked, he said, you're not gonna leave me alone until I tell you. I said, I'm waiting. He said, McDonald's. I immediately looked over at my husband and said, Sugar, come over here. This is the young man you wanna talk to. I introduced them. It ended up Bob set up an interview where we could go in and sit and talk and present ourselves in order to obtain a McDonald's restaurant. Now at this interview, we took Marguerite. During the interview, my husband was stammering, stuttering, and it surprised me. And so I asked for a little break. Asked the young man, to, could we have a soda or something like that? He goes out, I turned to my husband, I said, Joseph, I said, why are you stammering and stuttering? And he said, uh, I said, you act like you're ashamed of how you got from point A to point B. I said, you take a deep breath and you sit there and you tell this young man why you deserve this restaurant. And he looked at me, he said, oh, okay. So needless to say, when the young man comes back in, my husband is sitting there, he has got that backbone straight and he took over the interview. The young man finished interviewing him, turns to me and looks at me and says, and Carmelita, what do you do for a living? And I looked at him and said, very, very, very matter of fact, I inspire my husband and I motivate him. The guy said, okay, this interview is over with. And needless to say, we ended up with the McDonald's restaurant. I have always been one that would encourage my husband and just 
build that ego and stroke that ego and tell him there was nothing in the world that he could not accomplish. Because I knew once he accomplished that not only would I reap the benefits, the family would reap the benefits. And he would always be so proud of all of his accomplishments. And I would just tell him, look at this, look what you've done here and look what you've done there. It took encouraging and just building him and making him feel good about all of his accomplishments in life. Because I know we even went to get, buy a house at the uh, Lake of the Ozarks and it was like four lots sitting there. There were two, there was one home that was finished, one that was a shell and then two empty lots. And I told him, I said, oh, look at this. And he says, what? I said, I want the fist for sale. He looked at me and said, don't start. I said, but Joseph, I just want to know if they're for sale. He says, don't start with me, Nisi. I thought, come on, baby, let's just look at it. So we go up to the real estate office and we find out that, yes, it is for sale. And I said, well, do you know who is handling the property? Young man says, I'll find out. So he calls up to the main office and the return was, who's asking about the property? And the young man asked our name, we told him, and it was our real estate agent, Jackie Scott Thompson. Jackie said, send him up here to my office. We get up there, Jackie gives us the keys and tells us, look at the house, look at the other shell, and just make a list of stuff that you want repaired and done. And Joe is like, uh, we're not buying the jacket. We just, and she said, oh, just look at it. And I'll see you in the morning about eight or nine, okay? So we went, we make our little list and everything and we're looking, it's very nice. And I said, oh, we, I said, Joseph. He was like, what? I said, wouldn't it be nice if we were able to get this house? He said, it would be very nice. I said, ooh, and you know what else would be nice? He said, what? I said, if they would throw the other lots in with the deal. He said, girl, we can't afford the house. What makes you think we're going to get the other, the other three lots? He said, stop right now. I said, but Joseph, wouldn't it be nice? And he's fussing with me. And I said, baby, stop. He said, what? I said, just answer me. Wouldn't it be nice if along with this house, we could get the rest of the property? He said, yes, it would be nice. That's okay. So Jackie comes in, we're standing there and we're discussing the house. And she asked me, did you make your list? I gave her the list and we're about to walk out the door. And it was like she ran into a brick wall because we almost piled up on each other. And she stepped back and turned and I said, Jackie, she said, you know what? You all can afford this house. I know you can. And along with this house, we're going to throw in the rest of the property. We're just going to make this deal work. Joe looked at me and I looked at him. He said, shh, I'm scared of you. Shh, shh, don't say another word. Don't say a word. And he said, we closed that deal and got everything. I mean, my husband started doing one of those do, 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 do. moments on me. He said, because that does not happen. But we found favor with God on that. So just things like that, that we have been able to accomplish. I know that we have sat because of Joe Robinson. I have sat in rooms with millionaires and didn't know it. I have had millionaires to sit in my home. And one thing I found out about them they only wanted to be treated as people. They wanted you to just treat them like they were people. And that's how I treated them. When they came in, one guy got there and he was like, my feet are tired. May I take my shoes off? I said, yes. I said, make yourself at home as long as you respect my home. He took his shoes off. He leaned back. And I realized this man was really tired. So I went and got some pillows propped it up on my coffee table and told him, you can put your feet up there. He propped his feet up there and he went to sleep in my home. Joe looked at me, he said, uh, he's asleep. 
I said, well, the rest of you all can go downstairs and let him sleep, leave him alone. They did their little meeting downstairs, came upstairs, maybe about an hour or two later, and woke him up. And he looked around and said, oh, my God, I fell asleep. And I said, yeah. He said, I've never slept in anybody else's house. He said, I've never. But my prayer for my home was that when people opened the door and stepped over my threshold, I wanted them to feel the love. I wanted them to feel not only my love and Joe's love, I wanted them to feel the love of God in my home when they stepped across the threshold. And God began to reveal to me that yes, they feel the love because we did a function and this young lady brought her husband, had not seen him in a while because he had been sick, but she brought him. And she came on downstairs and I said, where is your husband? And she said, give him a moment, Carmelita. I said, what's wrong? She said, he's upstairs crying. And I was like, is he okay? She said, he told me when he stepped across the threshold. Now, I never talked to her. When he stepped across the threshold, he had never felt such love in all of his life. And he told me to go on downstairs and he would be down in a minute once he composed himself. Now, this friend, her name is Zella Jackson Price. And when Zella told me that, I had never told her about our prayer for our house. And when she told me that, I was like, thank you, Lord. Thank you. So I've had many people to come over the threshold and tell me <laughs> they didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay. They felt so comfortable. And so Joe and I... We just started getting closer and closer and closer together. I asked him one time for a fur coat. One time. I said, do you think I could get a piece of fur before I die? <laughs> and he laughed. He said, do you know how much a fur coat costs? I told him no. And we laughed about it. And my daughter was standing there. Needless to say, my birthday comes up. He, I get this beautiful surprise birthday party and everything. And my biggest surprise was my mink coat, my full length mink coat. But he would always surprise me. This man loved, he said he just loved to see the look on my face. My first biggest gift from him was when he presented me with my Mercedes Benz. I had been looking at this car and he was asking me, how do you like that car? I said, it's absolutely beautiful. It was a beautiful midnight blue. And I kept telling him, it's gorgeous. It's pretty. It's this. And we go on about our way. This birthday period, that car was sitting in front of the house with a big bow on top of it. And he gave me this humongous box which had about four or five other boxes in it. And finally, when I get to all these boxes, I have this one little box that looks like it has a pair of earrings in it, but it was the keys to the Mercedes Benz. And I'm telling you, when I walked outside, I almost fainted. My legs got weak and I was shaking. And he said, drive it. I said, no, I can't. I'm too nervous. I, I just can't do it. But he loved doing things like that just surprising me and presenting me with, oh my God, he would never ever come home empty handed. He would always bring me something, a piece of jewelry, uh, beautiful clothing, anything just to present it to me. And he would tell me, and don't you buy me anything. And I thought, I'm gonna have to stop listening to him and start buying him stuff like this. So my first big gift to him was this beautiful black onyx ring with diamonds around it and everything. And when he opened it, my baby started crying. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to have to surprise you a little bit more. You know? <laughs> the next thing I did, I gave him a surprise birthday party, had his friends there and everything. But these were little things that we did to keep our marriage alive and keep the love because, oh my God, we grew in love so deeply. So one girl even told me, she said, it, it doesn't sound right just to say Carmelita. I have to say Carmelita and Joseph. I have to say Carmelita and Joseph because if you see Joseph, 
Carmelita is there. And if you see Carmelita, Joseph is right there. He's going to always be there. So our love grew very, very deeply toward each other, very affectionately. We would be on the road. And sometimes all we do is just reach over and hold each other's hands. No conversation. Just hold each other's hands. Or I'd get close to him and nuzzle him just like, you know, when you were young and be driving. And you get close to your boyfriend, sit close to him and hold him and, and lay my head on his shoulder and we'd talk or have no conversation at all. But it was just the growth together, the bonding closer and closer. Even got to the point where we started discussing, you know, if, if you leave this earth before I do, what would you do? Would you remarry? Would you do this? Would you? And when he asked me, would I remarry? I looked at him and I said, no, I would never remarry again. And he said, was the marriage that bad? I said, no, the marriage was just that good. I said, Joseph, I'm spoiled. No man would want me. I said, you have spoiled me. I said, and it's not a bad thing. It is a good thing. I said, because of your love. I said, you would always be with me. So I don't think I would ever remarry again. I said, on the other hand, you, you would remarry. But I told my kids, I need you to cover your daddy and don't let just anybody slip in here and snatch him away and everything. And my oldest girl told me, Ma, nobody is coming up in this house. Nobody. If something happens to you, no woman can come up in here. I said, well, that would be your daddy's choice, not yours.